بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا يا كريم Dear colleagues, we'll start now one of the important lectures in the pediatric imaging and uh, it will deal with the provascular stroke and imaging of trauma. As you all know, we usually evaluate the brain by CT in cases of emergencies. And uh, yeah, you have discussed the way how to assess the brain by CT scan in uh, the uh, lectures previously uh, introduced about imaging of the normal adult player brain and also imaging of the normal pediatric brain. And just to remind you about the, the way we usually uh, uh, examine the patient before contrast injection, then we look at the scan and we assess if we are in need to inject contrast or not. Sometimes we want to uh, sedate the child and uh, in both cases, whenever we are intending to give contrast media or give sedation, the patient should fast for at least uh, three hours. Then uh, we usually do not need to inject the contrast media in whenever the brain scan is normal or we have diagnosed atrophic changes or hemorrhage or infarction. But uh, we need to inject the contrast material whenever we are suspecting intracranial infection or we want to uh, accurately diagnose some of the intracranial neoplasms. And the child is put in the spine position and we have the scanogram in the lateral view and our scanning area starts from the skull base at the orbitoviator line, which is the line passing from the external cancers to the external dietary canal. And we proceed from the skull base to the, to the vertex of the skull. We usually uh, use the 7 millimeter scan intervals for children and the 5 millimeter scan intervals for uh, infants. Then in our domain, we have to differentiate between two main uh, CT appearances, and these are uh, what we call the hypodense lesion, which is a lesion that is relatively black compared to the normal brain tissue. And in such a case, we are dealing with an ischemic or infarcted brain tissue. And uh, the second is the hyperdense lesion, which is a lesion that is more bright or more dense than the normal brain parenchyma. And in, in such a case, we are dealing with hemorrhage and sometimes calcium may give similar appearances. Then uh, why the lesion appears uh, uh, hypodense or hyperdense? And this is uh, related to what is known as the CT density or the um, uh, attenuation value. And this attenuation value is measured by the Hounsfield units. And you know that Hounsfield was the uh, bridge phys physicist who uh, introduced the uh, CT machine in the late uh, 70s. And uh, uh, the normal brain tissue, the attenuation value of the normal brain tissue ranges between 30 and 40 Hounsfield units. Then, uh, any normal structure or lesion which measures below 30 will appear black and another lesion which measures above 40 will appear relatively bright. And CSF, uh, the attenuation value of CSF is about ranges between 0 and 15 Hounsfield unit. That of the fat, like this in the, in the orbital fat, uh, measures uh, minus values uh, starting from minus uh, 10 up to or down to minus 200. And air will measure air in the paranasal sinuses, air in the mustoid air cells will uh, measure in attenuation value uh, 
a much lower uh, CT attenuation minus 300 and now then um, the uh, infarction or the ischemic brain tissue will measure about uh, 20, uh, in the range of 25 pounds sealed unit brain edema surrounding tumor or inflammatory lesion measures about 20 pounds sealed units and the cyst in the brain will appear high potency like this one depending on the contents of the cyst whether it is an arachnoid cyst or uh, epidermoid cyst or high dated cyst for example all these have uh, different attenuation values but they appear uh, black compared to the normal uh, brain brinkman then uh, hyperdense lesions or lesions that are more bright than the brain parenchyma include hemorrhage and this is an example of an epidural hematoma in the right frontal uh, region which is very bright compared to the brain parenchyma and the second uh, bright lesion is calcium and calcium will appear more dense than the brain parenchyma and more dense than hemorrhage as well. Hemorrhage uh, measures 60 to 90 ounce field unit, while calcium will measure above 200 ounce field units. Then uh, the pediatric risk of cerebrovascular diseases will be handled in these topics. Number one, the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, which is a major issue in the pediatric age group then we will have some idea about the non-accidental trauma and uh, we'll have a good explanation about the traumatic cerebrovascular injuries in the pediatric age group and this include uh, a lot of lesions then finally we'll have some words about the vascular intracranial uh, lesions in the children you know that uh, neonatal encephalopathy is a, a big term which includes many conditions and uh, this hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is one of them the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is one of the common causes of severe neurological deficits in the children and uh, this is the incidence is about six every 1000 life births and you know the difference between hypoxia and ischemia Hypoxia means diminished oxygen content to the blood of the blood and the ischemia means that there is decrease in the cerebral uh, blood flow. Then we have to discriminate the uh, changes in the uh, neonates considering whether they are uh, preterm or full term infants. The premature infants will have different lesions compared to those uh, born at the normal uh, uh, expected uh, gestational age. Then uh, there are a marked difference between the changes seen in the preterm infant compared to the term infant. In the preterm, we have these abnormalities, including periventricular leukomalacia, the germinal matrix hemorrhage, intraventricular and intracerebral hemorrhage while in the term infant we have the global ischemia the uh, uh, the watershed uh, ischemic changes the infarction similar to the adults and also the focal ischemic uh, changes then why this is uh, this difference is present that's because of the appearance of the blood supply to the brain uh, tissue which is different from the preterm compared to the term infant and the preterm uh, or the premature neonate the brain has a ventricular beetle vascular pattern and hypoperfusion will result as you can see from this drawing in the area intimately related to the ventricular wall while in the term infant, there is a, a ventriculofugal vascular pattern, which uh, indicates that most of the in insults will uh, be approximately uh, 
uh, within the gray white matter region or somewhat away from the ventricular wall. Then the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in general in uh, the term infant will present clinically by these manifestations. As you all know, or the pediatricians know, that uh, a patient will have a low Apgar score at the, uh, the delivery, and this will include the slow heart rate, poor respiratory effort, abnormal skin color, decreased level of alertness, and abnormal muscle tone, and also maybe weak or absent cry. Then. Uh, there may be metabolic acidosis in the spinal cord blood sample and uh, the patient early in his life will develop seizures and abnormal EEG results. Then uh, if we are talking about the preterm infant or the premature infant, we have the four lesions mentioned before. And these are the periventricular leukomalacia the germinal matrix hemorrhage, intraventricular and intracerebral hematomas. And you remember that most of these lesions will occur in the periventricular area due to the uh, development of the blood supply to the brain tissue in this particular age group. Then the periventricular leukomalacia means that there is ischemic changes in the white matter and this will appear uh, immediately related to the wall of the ventricle. The ischemic white matter will appear hypodense or in the CT scan and of low signal in MRI, uh, T1 and the high signal and T2 weighted images. This hypoxic uh, white matter will progress uh, rapidly to form cystic areas of encephalomalacia and this will affect the appearance of the of the ventricle which uh, at that at this time the ventricle will have uh, will have will have a, a characteristic appearance as you can see then uh, this abnormality is commonly seen in the premature infants and uh, they are now uh, every premature infant should be checked for the presence of these uh, complications including the periventricular leukomalacia and the germinal matrix hemorrhage. In cases of leukomalacia, as I mentioned, there are areas in the white matter intimately related to the ventricle. They are uh, of low signal in the T1 and high signal in the T2 weighted images. And also ultrasound is very helpful, transcranial ultrasound, in detection of the cystic changes in the white matter in around the, the uh, ventricles. These patients will uh, clinically complain of some uh, uh, relatively characteristic manifestations and this is one of them which is the spastic diplegia or paraplegia and also they may have some attacks of uh, seizures. Then uh, uh, the periventricular white matter will be uh, affected and these are the most common sites are the trigone of the lateral ventricles in this area and the cerebral white matter around the region of the foramina of Monroe. And here you can see in this uh, MRI T2 weighted image that the white matter around the uh, ventricles appeared uh, relatively scanty and it showed abnormal signal together with uh, the lobulation of the ventricular wall, which is the result of periventricular uh, leukomalacia. Extensive necrosis of the deep white matter adjacent to the ventricles will result in the decrease of the mass of the white matter. And you can compare here the white matter in the frontal loop, which is relatively good, to the white matter in the occipital loop, which is reduced in size, together with increase in its uh, 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 signal in T2 and also in the flare weighted images. Uh, the incidence is about uh, of this, uh, according to the literature, about 70% of the uh, preterm 
this disease is seen in 70% of the preterm infants with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and is considered rare in the term uh, uh, neonates. Then the manifestations by CT and by MRI, of course MRI is more sensitive. Uh, there, are, there is a ventricular megaly with abnormal configuration and undulation of the ventricular surface. And you see that the ventricular wall is somewhat lobulated and the ventricles are uh, uh, non-uniformly dilated. Also, you've got loss of the periventricular white matter, especially in the uh, common areas around the trigone of the lateral ventricles. If you compare the white matter in the frontal uh, lobes, it is somewhat good, but there is marked reduction of the white matter in the uh, occipital parietal area. Also here in the T1, you see the white matter in the frontal lobe is good, and there is marked reduction of the white matter compared to the posterior aspects of the ventricles. There may be thinning of the corpus uh, callosum, and uh, late in the disease, the ischemic white matter will develop cystic changes of encephalomalacia. This is also a case of uh, periventricular leukomalacia in the T1, T2, and the flare weighted images. The changes are evident in, the, in all bulk sequences, and you see the abnormal signal in the white matter and the reduction of the size of the white matter itself and also the appearance of the ventricular wall. And this is also another case, T1, T2, and the flare. And then you can see the abnormal signal of the white matter, which uh, will be bright in T1 and in T2 and the flare weighted images. And also you look to the ventricular wall, which is lobulated or undulated. Late in the disease, there will be cystic changes of encephalomalacia in the white matter, which means that this is the end stage of the disease. Then we came to the germinal matrix hemorrhage. And this also is commonly seen in the premature infants. And you know, the germinal matrix is the layer uh, which is uh, located in the ventricular wall responsible for the formation of the cortex, as I have mentioned in the lecture of cortical formation. And uh, this germinal matrix uh, will involute except uh, the region uh, in the near the head of the caudate nucleus, which is the most common site to develop this type of hemorrhage in the premature uh, neonate. Then this hemorrhage occurring intimately related to the ventricle, it may have an access to enter the ventricular lumen. And this may result in uh, obstructive hydrocephalus and ventricular dilatation. Then hemorrhage may extend also into the uh, brain parenchyma. And according to the size of the hemorrhage and the, the uh, extent uh, within the ventricles, and then the size of the ventricles, we have the grades of germinal matrix hemorrhage. One important note is uh, that the preterm infants should be routinely screened for uh, this uh, germinal matrix hemorrhage. And the best way is, of course, by the transcranial uh, ultrasound. These are the grades of germinal matrix hemorrhage. Then grade one, when hemorrhage is confined to the region of the caudate nucleus or the germinal matrix. In grade two, when hemorrhage is, uh, uh, is extended inside the ventricle, but the ventricle is not dilated. Grade three, when hemorrhage is inside the ventricle and the ventricle is dilated. Grade four, when hemorrhage occurs also within the brain tissue. Then uh, one of the important tools for a screening of uh, premature infants is at the transcranial ultrasound. And you can easily appreciate the hemorrhage within the ventricles, and which are dilated, indicative of a grade three germinal matrix hemorrhage. The clinical presentation is usually in the form of cerebral palsy, mental retardation, and uh, seizures. Then this is an ultrasound, this is a coronal and sagittal uh, 
uh, ultrasound or transcranial ultrasound showing the echogenic hemorrhage in the uh, region of the caudate nucleus and also can be appreciated in the uh, sagittal image. This is a CT scan without contrast showing there is germinal matrix hemorrhage in the region of the head of the caudate nucleus bilaterally with extension, extension of the hemorrhage within the ventricles which are more or less not dilated indicating that this is stage 1 stage 2 germinal matrix hemorrhage but in this stage 3 uh, hemorrhage you can see hemorrhage in the germinal matrix and intraventricular blood and the ventricles are dilated and this is grade 3 germinal matrix hemorrhage by sagittal ultrasound and you see the echogenic uh, blood within the ventricle and ventricle is dilated and also you see the hyperdense blood within the ventricles and the ventricles are uh, mildly dilated and this is also an example of germinal matrix hemorrhage grade or type 3 by ultrasound and by MRI T1 and T2 weighted images. In the ultrasound, the ventricles are dilated and they contain echogenic blood. In MRI, the ventricles are considerably dilated and they contain blood of high signal in the T1 and a relatively decreased signal in the T2, denoting the presence of subacute uh, blood products. Germinal matrix hemorrhage will lead to destruction of the germinal matrix, will lead to periventricular hemorrhagic infarctions, and uh, 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 when hemorrhage regress, it will leave areas of uh, encephalomalacia, and uh, due to the obstruction of the CSF pathways, there may be hydrocephalus. Then we have exposed these uh, abnormalities in the preterm uh, infant including the periventricular leukomalacia, the germinal matrix hemorrhage, and its extension inside the ventricle as well as in the brain parenchyma. Then we came to the changes in the term infant, which will include the global ischemia, the cortical and the subcortical infarctions, the parasagittal watershed infarctions, and the, the focal ischemic changes. And then, the global cerebral ischemia is uh, one of the manifestations of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy where there is diffuse involvement of the brain parenchyma uh, including the white matter and the gray matter and um, this appearance is almost uh, common in cases of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in uh, the term infants where you got hypodense, extensive hypodensity of the cerebral tissue. There may be sparing of the basal ganglia and commonly there is a sparing of the cerebellum. And this sign is referred to as the white cerebellar uh, sign or the reversal, the reversal sign. And here you see that uh, there is a diffuse hypodensity of the uh, white and the gray matter of the uh, brain parenchyma and you remember that uh, early in early uh, in early uh, in early post uh, unit in early neonatal period of the term infant you may uh, you know that the white matter has a lot of water content and it will appear hypodense on the CT and low signal in MRI T1 and high signal on MRI T2 weighted images. But uh, you remember that the cortex is not affected by this water content. The cortex will appear of uh, a relatively ice dense signal or uh, it will show normal signal on MR images. But there are two uh, main findings in the CT and the MRI to predict that this is not the normal appearance of the uh, brain tissue. The first one is the affection of the cortex by the high densities in the CT, the low signal intensities in MRI. Number two is affection of the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia is, uh, is spared in most of the uh, cases, but affection of the basal ganglia is uh, 
an indication that you, the changes you are seeing in the in the brain parenchyma are not uh, uh, due to the normal water content in this uh, early neonatal period. Then here, if you look here and you see this is the white matter only, which is affected by hypodensities. The basal ganglia is intact and the cortex is also intact. At that time, it's very difficult to diagnose hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy by CT and by MRI because the, this may, may uh, appear to be the normal water content of the white matter at this uh, age group. And if you have the MRI, the water content of the white matter will appear low signal in the T1 and high signal in the T2, then you need at that time the help of diffusion weighted images by MRI to separate the normal water content from the ischemic white matter. And as I have mentioned, there are some clues to uh, uh, predict whether these changes, this is a, an infant three days old, and this is considered normal white matter hypodensity in this very early neonatal period. But one of the clues that this is ischemic changes is the appearance of hypodensities in the thalami and the basal ganglia. And this uh, uh, is one of the signs. Then global cerebral ischemia will appear like this on the CT images. There are diffuse hypodensity affecting the cortex and the white matter. And there may be some sparing of the basal ganglia. And uh, uh, sometimes you, you, you see that the, the cerebellum is also spared. Then uh, ultrasound is good. In this uh, particular domain, number one, it can exclude the presence of hemorrhage. It can exclude the possibility of very ventricular Leukomalacia, and it also can assess if the patient had hydrocephalus or not. But uh, CT is considered the least sensitive modality for evaluation of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in the early neonatal uh, period because of the increased water content of the neonatal white matter uh, uh, in this uh, very early stage. Then, as I have mentioned, you need the help. <coughs> of uh, diffusion-weighted MRI images, and this is considered the most sensitive to, uh, to evaluate the diseased areas. And here you can see these bright signals in the, in the basal ganglia, as well as in the cortex and the, the subcortical white matter. The, the areas which will show diffusion restriction, they will appear bright whenever the CSF is black, indicating that these are abnormal uh, abnormal ischemic areas. And here is the CT scan showing diffuse hypodensity of both cerebral hemispheres with a sparing of the cerebellum and relative sparing of the basal ganglia. An MRI, and this is T2 weighted image, and you can see some brightness in the, in the cortex, but the white matter is more or less uh, appearing good. If you see the post contrast image and you see the white matter is relatively myelinated and there is a, a, there is a, some abnormal enhancement in the cortex of the brain corresponding to the areas of high signal and the T2 weighted image. But if you uh, look to the uh, diffusion weighted images and you can see that there is a considerable diffusion uh, restriction in the white matter denoting its involvement. Then in severe cases of global cerebral ischemia, you see diffuse uh, high density of the uh, white and the gray matter involving the cortex and the white matter. There may be sparing of the basal ganglia and also sparing of the cerebellum. And uh, this sparing of the cerebellum is known as the reversal uh, sign on CT and is usually associated with uh, bad prognosis. And MRI can also assess the possibility of hemorrhage depending on the signal, can uh, see cerebral infarctions, 
can also uh, uh, exclude the possibility of neoplasms and also assess for the presence of congenital malformations. And this is a good example of uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy with the reversal sign or the white cerebellum sign. The brain tissue is relatively black compared to the cerebellum. There is loss of the gray-white matter interface. There is affection of the cortex as well as the white matter. And this is the white cerebellum or the reversal uh, sign, which where you can see that the cerebellum is of normal uh, CT density, while the rest of the brain parenchyma is hypotense. Sometimes you got uh, a sparing of the basal ganglia with the cerebellum, and, uh, and uh, other times you can see that the basal ganglia are also involved. And the involvement of the basal ganglia is usually uh, it carries a bad prognosis for uh, the patient. And then this is uh, an example where you can see that the uh, codate and the lentiform nuclei are uh, appear markedly hypodense or uh, ischemic together with some changes in the in the brain parenchyma. And this is usually seen in what's known as near uh, drowning, where uh, there is uh, 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 there is uh, transient cardiac arrest and asphyxia, uh, which may occur after submission in uh, in water. And most of these uh, infants or children will have severe neurological impairment, and only one third of them may remain neurologically intact. In MRI, you got one, some of the manifestations previously seen, like uh, uh, focal or generalized brain edema at first, which will lead to ischemic insult after that, basal ganglia affection, cortical abnormalities, and the brain stem infarctions. In the first 24 hours, the presence of edema in the basal ganglia which include the uh, lentiform and the uh, the codate nuclei as well as the thalami is sensitive and specific for uh, poor outcome, as I have mentioned. And this is an, a, a post-mortem non-contrast CT uh, brain scan showing extensive involvement of the uh, cerebral tissue with severe impact on the basal ganglia, the codate and the lentiform, as well as the thalami, together with the most of the brain tissue, sparing the cerebellum. Then, also the changes in, in, in the basal ganglia may not apparent on CT and the, the usual MRI, and you may need in uh, uh, many times the help of diffusion weighted images to see restricted diffusion in ischemic areas as you can see in these basal ganglia this is the body and tail of the codate nucleus this is the lentiform and this is the head of the codate and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy later on will result in cystic encephalomalacia in the brain parenchyma with severe damage of the brain tissue and the consequent dilatation of the ventricles due to loss of volume of the cerebral tissue. And uh, involvement of the cortex may lead to what's known as cortical laminar necrosis. And um, this cortical laminar necrosis usually appears in the CT scan as hyper uh, dense uh, cerebrinous like uh, areas within the cerebral cortex. And uh, it was thought that these hyperdensities are due to hemorrhage, but uh, according to the literature, they are due to denaturated proteins in dying cells, not due to methemoglobin or the uh, blood products. The cortical gray matter involvement will result in this disease, which is the cortical laminar necrosis and this will appear uh, in, the, in the CT scan as hyperdense 
serpiginous cortical lesions, and also in MRI, it will show hyper intensity on the T1 uh, weighted image. And this is a case of uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and uh, it shows clearly the uh, white cerebellar sign sparing of the basal ganglia. Then uh, 10 days later, the CT scan showed extensive changes. The cortex showed these uh, uh, very well demonstrated hyperdensities representing cortical laminar uh, necrosis and also the start of dilatation of the ventricular system denoting the loss of volume of ischemic uh, brain tissue. And um, this uh, patient was brought unconscious uh, to the casualty with low pulse and the blood pressure. And you see here uh, uh, the uh, changes in the basal ganglia as well as in the cortex of the uh, brain tissue. In uh, basal ganglia involvement is usually uh, bilateral and uh, symmetric. It is one of the manifestations of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. The affected basal ganglia will include the thalami, the caudate nuclei, and the lentiform uh, nuclei. Sometimes involvement of the basal ganglia is seen isolated from involvement of the brain parenchyma uh, or may be associated with involvement of the brain parenchyma. And you see here there is selective involvement of the basal ganglia which show uh, high, high signal uh, intensity in the lentiform and in the, uh, in the salami. And this is also an example of a near drowning insult with uh, more or less selective involvement of the basal ganglia. Did you see the head of the caudate nucleus is hypodense, the lentiform nucleus, and the thalamus. Also, you can see uh, some a small frontal uh, subdural, chronic subdural hematoma. And this is a, a patient who attempted uh, suicide by hanging, then you see the global cerebral ischemia. There are, there is diffuse hypodensity of the brain parenchyma involving the cortex and the medulla, selective involvement or severe involvement of the uh, medial part of the lentiform nuclei, the globus pallidus, and uh, you can see that the cerebellum is spurred, what we call the reversal sign or the dense uh, cerebellar sign. And uh, this appearance is uh, sometimes commonly seen in the clinical uh, practice, which is an indication of profound hypoxic ischemic injury to the brain parenchyma. And uh, this is usually uh, uh, seen immediately before uh, death or even after uh, death. This uh, uh, changes, as you can see here, there are extensive hypodensity of the brain tissue. Uh, there is some uh, sparing of the basal ganglia, and you got uh, areas of hemorrhages, especially in the subdural uh, space. And uh, you see here hemorrhage in the sylvian fissure and uh, hemorrhage related to the posterior part of the Interhemispheric fissure denoting its uh, subdural uh, location. And this hemorrhage is actually not secondary to uh, trauma as was suspected uh, to be uh, in difficult driver uh, or so, but uh, this hemorrhage is due to ischemia of the vessel wall. And this ischemia will result in damage of the vessel wall resulting in, uh, in hemorrhage. And here you can see that the brainstem and the cerebellum appear relatively hyperdense. They are spared from this uh, ischemic insult. They see diffuse hypodensity of the brain parenchyma, and they see the areas of hemorrhage within the sylvian fish. There is obliteration of the quadrigeminal uh, cistern, and the quadrigeminal cistern is here due to swelling of the brain parenchyma, which is usually an indication of impending 
colonization. Acute tentorial and the posterior fox subdural hematomas are usually the sequelae of ischemic vasculopathy, which will result in the damage of the wall of the vessel and the, the uh, bleeding in the subdural space. Also, there may be subarachnoid uh, sub damage. Then uh, this is the post-mortem brain damage. As I have mentioned, this is an indication of profound cerebral ischemia. Whenever you see the global hypodensity of the brain together with hemorrhagic spots in the subarachnoid and in the subdural space. Then uh, one of the changes of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is what's known as the watershed infarctions or the border zone infarction. These infarctions occur between the tertiaries of the vessels. In here you see this is the vascular tertiary of the anterior cerebral artery and this is the yellow is the vascular tertiary of the middle cerebral artery and the green one is the vascular tertiary of the posterior cerebral artery. Then uh, the watershed infarctions occur at the zones in between the tertiaries, like in this area between the anterior and middle cerebral and uh, this area also between the uh, the uh, uh, middle cerebral artery and the, the uh, uh, deep cerebral uh, the, the vessels it related to the ventricular wall and here uh, between the middle cerebral and the, the posterior uh, cerebral artery. And this is a watershed infarction. If you go to the drawing, it, it occurs here between the middle and the posterior cerebral. And here, this is a, a wedge-shaped area of abnormal signal intensity between the middle cerebral and the posterior cerebral tertiary. And of course, the watershed infarctions are the sequelae of drop of the blood pressure uh, that is unable to maintain the capillary uh, uh, pressure essential for tissue perfusion. Then you got an ischemic area between the uh, vascular territories like this one between the anterior cerebral and the middle cerebral. And these are also watershed infarctions between the uh, cerebral vascular territories. They show high signal in, uh, in the flare image. And you know these infarctions, they, they may be uh, bilateral and sometimes they are symmetric. And here is a diffusion weighted image showing diffusion restriction in the uh, medial aspect of the left cerebral hemisphere representing a watershed infarction. The uh, end stage of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is the uh, uh, appearance of a totally damaged, destroyed brain parenchyma, which is the seat of multiple cystic areas of encephalomalacia uh, with uh, dilated ventricles to compensate the loss of volume of the ischemic tissue. And there may be foci or areas of uh, calcification within the uh, dead brain tissue. Infarction uh, is uh, uh, an area of uh, uh, focal uh, cerebral ischemia and uh, this can also occur in the pediatric age group. It's not that common like in adults, but sometimes you can see a focal infarcted area in the children. And I, I used to mention that the infarction is not a specific buying lesion, meaning that the mass effect exerted by infarction is usually due to the associated brain edema and uh, 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 this is an indication that this infarction is in the acute stage whenever it is compressing the ventricle. And this is a patient with endocarditis showing an infarction in the temporo-occipital area. It is cortical and subcortical in distribution, similar exactly to the infarction seen in adults. And, uh, uh, you can see there is some compression of the adjacent uh, ventricle. And this is also an, an acute infarction in the basal ganglia affecting the head of the caudate as well as the lentiform uh, nucleus with a mass effect on the uh, right lateral ventricle. This is also acute stroke in the 
frontal and uh, temporal areas. And uh, here you may be able to see that this lesion involves the common carotid tree tree, including the anterior cerebral and the middle cerebral, with consequent some mass effect on the uh, left lateral ventricle. And this is also the bilateral occipital infarctions affecting the, the posterior aspect of the uh, brain with some mass effect on the adjacent ventricles. This is uh, left cerebral infarction affecting the left cerebral hemisphere, which have been relatively high potence compared to the normal right cerebral hemisphere. The changes are not well appreciated in the T1 weighted image, but they are uh, relatively appreciated in this T2 weighted image, which is performing three days after the, uh, the uh, CT scan. And uh, the uh, result of an infarcted brain tissue is the loss of volume and atrophic changes. Whenever the infarction affects the whole cerebral hemisphere, there may be the changes similar to this, which is known as cerebral hemiatrophy. And then this cerebral hemiatrophy, you will see number one, eccentric position of the falx cerebri, uh, dilatation of the ventricle in the atrophic hemisphere, as well as dilatation of the cortical sulci, sylvian fissure, and all the extra axial CSF spaces. There may be some. Uh, parenchymal areas of encephalomalacia as well the, compared to the normal sized uh, uh, hemisphere. Then a uh, few words about the non-accidental trauma or what we call the battered baby syndrome or the shaken baby syndrome. Of course, in, uh, in, uh, if we uh, uh, shake our babies, uh, there may be some uh, insults in the brain parenchyma because of the uh, uh, relatively small size of the uh, brain compared to the size of the skull, then any uh, uh, shaking uh, maneuver will result in uh, variable uh, damage to the brain in some time. Then it is recommended not to shake in a, your infant uh, uh, by any means because uh, uh, at that time he is liable to develop a brain injury because of this uh, the shaking procedures. And uh, I will show some of the examples uh, which are included under this title, the shaking baby syndrome. And here you can see a focal area of, uh, of hemorrhage. And also you can see widening of the frontal subdural space. And this will result from a tear in the arachnoid uh, membrane, and this uh, will result in leak of the CSF uh, from the subarachnoid space into the subdural space, resulting in this uh, appearance, which is known as the subdural hygroma. And this is also an example by MRI T2 weighted images. And here you got uh, a, a damage of the uh, brain vascular blood supply with uh, extensive hypodensities in the uh, occipital lobes seen by CT and also by MRI T2 weighted image they are of bright signal and um, this uh, will progress into uh, brain damage and uh, atrophic changes and permanent insult of course and this is also a subdural bleeding secondary to uh, this syndrome, which is uh, the uh, shaking baby syndrome. We, in the CT scan in the axial images, showed the presence of blood in the subdural space. And this blood is of two components, a hyperdense component and a hypodense component. And this is known as a swirl sign. And uh, it means that the, there is a hyperacute bleeding, which is a very, very recent bleeding of mixed densities. Low uh, densities represent the uh, uh, unclotted blood, and the hyper densities represent the clotted blood. The mixture of hypo and hyper densities, and you see the extension into the tentorial leaflet as well, and the extension into the posterior part of the falx. 
and this means that you are dealing with a hyper uh, acute uh, subdural hematoma. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.